I'm going to go over briefly a, a couple things that I'm working on and my, my little sketch on the, on the budget presentation. Uh, one of the bills I am still working on, as Ellen has said, and I'm working on it with her, she's, she's fantastic. Every time I have a, a good bill and I'm looking for a Senate author, Ellen is always ready and willing, and she fights hard on it on the Senate side as well. But the paid sick days is critical. I can't say any more than she did about that bill, but it is important. Um, it belies any notion that this is going to be a burden on business. I do note that $8 billion a year is lost in our national economy due to presenteeism, the people showing up and infecting others, um, and that includes at the places where you buy your food and you take your children to be taken care of. Um, that's going to be a significant factor that we believe will present a cost savings when people are allowed to take minimum numbers of sick days, which amounts to uh, only about uh, it's four days, is that right, Ellen, a maximum? total a maximum of four days that you can get per year and it doesn't carry over. So it's just a basic number that will take care of folks. This came from originally a bill that we had several years ago, which was fair share, fair share health care, noting that uh, a large percentage of large employers were just shifting their health care costs onto you, the taxpayers. Many people would get on Minnesota care in Minnesota, they'd get on Badger care in uh, Wisconsin, they'd get on some of the state paid health cares in Maryland and in North Carolina. Uh, when they showed up for work at Walmart, for example, Walmart would just give the, uh, the employee a, an application for the state paid health care and say, yeah, you can get health care here, and they give them a state, a state paid health care application. So the taxpayers were footing the bill, and this was an effort to just say, you know what, if you as a company with a major number of employers, and it was someone over uh, 10 or 15,000 workers in the state were relying on state paid health care, that they'd have, to, they'd have to pony up, they'd have to give back into the pool to make sure it's all taken care of. That was overturned by an ERISA law, a federal law. Walmart successfully fought that and had it overturned in Maryland, and we've been having to fight that ever since and waiting for action on the federal level to do that. So paid sick days is the next incarnation to ensure that folks are taken care of. Uh, number two, uh, mandatory plastic bag recycling, which is something that I brought up based on a, a, an idea from one of my friends in California. Uh, this uh, would make sure that all those bags floating around in the garbage tornadoes that you see outside the buildings um, are swept up and put in. When you have opportunities, you go to some of the grocery stores around here, you can bring in your plastic bags. But some of the other major retailers don't even have that opportunity. We didn't want to ensure that there were those opportunities. Um, as you know, uh, Target uh, and uh, some of the other non-food retailers do not participate in that. Um, that's something that I'm still working on with the working group. The problem is where they enacted it in California, one thing that I discovered to my chagrin is every single county in California has a recycling center, a very adequate and up-to-date recycling center so that local merchants have the opportunity to ensure that they can just get their money back. And these plastic bags are then turned into the, um, the plastic lumber that you see on some decks. Um, in Minnesota, we don't have anything even close to that. So many of the merchants have been complaining, and rightfully so. I'm not going to spend my Saturdays driving up to Minneapolis to the recycling center. Um, and so I've discovered we have to back up and start working around the access to recycling as well in Minnesota. So it opened my eyes to a whole new other problem. Now, the other area that, that I work on, as many of you are familiar, I'm a, a prosecutor for the city of St. Paul, and I see a lot of the public safety hits that have been occurring in St. Paul and in Minneapolis, specifically due to the governor's LGA cuts. Uh, so on these, these uh, the cuts that we have proposed to police or that are inevitably going to be proposed to police are directly due to local government aid, and so that's one other area that I've been working on is LGA as it goes through the tax committee. You've heard about the federal stimulus dollars. These are one-time dollars. So we want to hire some cops or keep some cops. We can't do it if we, we want to keep them beyond four years. It's just not going to happen. And so the one-time dollars have to be spent creatively through burn grants and cops funding. Do people here remember the Clinton cops dollars that came through at the federal level years ago? Well, that's something that we want to do on the state level to ensure that when that federal stimulus, those federal stimulus dollars come through the Department of Public Safety, that they're properly spent to ensure that our neighborhoods are kept safe. Now, when Tim Pawlenty did his budget presentation, and you know, uh, the public safety dollars, uh, what, what the governor, when he said he presented his, his, his budget proposal, he said he wanted to do harm with um, veterans, military, uh, public safety, and education. And 
the problem is what he didn't tell you is when he pr proposed his, his public safety budget, which generally held public safety harmless, that's state patrol, that's courts, that's public defenders. It didn't include police and fire. Uh, when, when, we, when I think of public safety, I think of things like police and fire, things at the local level. And indeed it's true because 80% of public safety dollars are spent at the local level in Minnesota. So when he says that he's going to hold public safety harmless or to make sure that you're safe in your neighborhood, he hasn't done a thing for it. He's slashed local government aid to the tune of $14 million in St. Paul. That's our police. That's our fire. Those are the things that are keeping you safe in your neighborhood. And so when Mayor Coleman called him on that, he revised his message and stated, well, you know, the state measure of public safety, which is only 20% of the entire bill. You're going to see cops being laid off, cops not, not being present in your neighborhoods where they once were, uh, and the governor needs to be accountable for that. That's local government aid. So yesterday there was a press conference, and I was really surprised to see this. I didn't see this. I saw police officers and firefighters up there at the Capitol saying, Tim Pawlenty, you need to be accountable. One firefighter even stood up there and said, shame on you, governor, uh, which I had, I had not heard a firefighter say before, a police officer. And they were up there saying that, which surprised me. And I, I understand now that they're starting to get it. They're starting to see that if you, want, if you want to be responsible and say you're holding public safety harmless, you need to make sure local government aid is taken care of. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to wrap through this really quick, because, again, I've already gone on longer than I intended. Um, but uh, Alan already talked about the ju judiciary. The courts are talking about decriminal, decriminalizing a whole slew of crimes that before were mandatory jail and mandatory court appearances for repeat offenders. And I asked the courts on the record in committee, I said, what are you guys going to do when you get sued? Or uh, writs are asked for by members of the public whose, pu whose safety is risked by the fact that you're not taking care of crimes that are brought to you now. And Sue DeSalle, the state court administrator, admitted on the record and she said, under this budget proposal from the governor, we will not do things that we are constitutionally and legally required to do. And I was flabbergasted. And I, I was also very happy that she admitted that uh, because it's really important to know this is a huge problem. We're going to see the consequences of this, even if we do get some revenue increases, uh, go on in the future years because of this crisis. Uh, lastly, with respect to the revenue side of the budget, the governor's proposal uh, to solve a $4.8 billion deficit, which we see is going to balloon to somewhere around $7 billion when the next forecast comes out on Tuesday. Um, he didn't, he did not only did he not solve the problem, because this $1 billion borrowing scheme is already found to be illegal or have legal issues with certain courts. So he hasn't even solved the problem. Not only did he do that, but he made it worse by tacking on $287 million in additional spending. Um, as you can see in the presentation that Alice made, uh, for corporate income tax cuts. Uh, I, I had a problem with that. I was very surprised, but I think the governor knows that in any negotiation, the person who comes through with the first offer, uh, it puts himself behind the eight ball. So he, he did a non-starter with his proposal. It was, it was not even a starting deal. Um, he made the problem worse. Uh, with that proposal that he made, uh, again, in the out years, 2012 to 2013, there is still a $2.5 billion shortfall. So this structural deficit where we always seem to be in a crisis, it's not solved this year, and it's not solved in the out years, and you think the problems are bad now, they're going to continue to get worse. Uh, on page 13 of that handout, you see where the problem comes from. With, with the governor's uh, mantra of we don't have a spending, we don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem, is proven to be true. The, the, that, that pie graph right there will show you that this is a revenue problem. And in the, the income tax cuts that were made in uh, 1999, 2000, 2001, we ended up with an ongoing $1 billion annual shortfall uh, since 2000. Now you do the math and figure out if that would make up for the current budget deficit we're in at $4.8 billion. Um, the fact is we need to fix this. We need to fix it for the long term. Uh, the, the price of government issue, which is on page 11, will also note in general the, the, price of the, the amount that you spend on government has, has been roughly the same since 1991. Um, I'm not saying that we should expand that, but the fact is a government has generally been, been responsible with the overall tax dollar as far as which programs should be, should be paid for and which ones should uh, die on the vine. Um, that's still an open question that should be had. Uh, 
But uh, with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me, and we'll, we'll move to questions. I'm going